Hey world, Dan Brown here with another edition of EDH Rec Tech, the Magic the Gathering deck building show uh, where we focus on the format known as Elder Dragon Highlander using the popular online deck building resource EDH Rec. Uh, what EDH Rec does is it sources, crowdsources, thousands of deck lists from all sorts of different commanders, from all sorts of different people, and it tells you uh, cards that people like to use in their commander deck with given commanders. Uh, there's a specific section on each commander's page, though, called signature cards. Those are cards that are disproportionately prevalent in a given commander's 99. And uh, what the point of this show is, is to give me a platform to share with you my opinions as to which of those cards are good and which of those cards are bad, which is to say where the masses are building their decks right and where the masses are leading the rest of the masses all kinds of astray. And in this fourth episode, we are looking at Vorinclex, the voice of hunger. Arr, look at how hungry that dude is. I don't even know where his mouth is. I think I know where his mouth is, although I'm not 100% sure. Regardless, he's hungry. He costs eight mana. He's a legendary creature, as they all are. He's a Praetor. Uh, he's got Trample. Whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana to your mana pool of any type that land produced. That's going to be green in this deck. Um, and whenever an opponent taps land for mana, that land does not untap during their next untap step. That's brutal. Costs eight mana to get him out, but once he's out, man, it, he's pretty good. He's going to make you a threat. Like, your opponents are going to... Not, not, not only are they going to want to, they're going to need to gang up on you because their lands, like, don't untap, you know. It's going to become very problematic for them very quickly if they don't get them off the board. So you want to be a little strategic in when you drop your Vorn Clex. We'll get to that in a bit, though. Here's just a little quick glimpse of the signature cards, at least when I'm filming this. As always, a little disclaimer, um, new sets will come out between now and when you're watching this and so these signature cards will change but regardless is still you know snapshot in time still still should be informational edutainmentable for all people <laughs> G galta primal hunger costs 12 mana what that that that's too much mana to spend on one creature you might be thinking but galta costs x less where X is the total power of creatures you control. Yeah, it's just a big scary trampler that you can get out there relatively inexpensively depending on what the board's looking like. Um, you gotta win somehow, mono green, big scary tramplers seems like the best way to do it if we're not trying to run combos, which we're not. Because that's not, that's just not the kind of commander I'm trying to teach you guys to play. Yeah, I'm nothing against combo, like I, I have combo decks. I love playing combo uh, pods. I just don't feel like that's like the average, the median commander player trying to play more of a 75% like attack to win sort of game world spine worm uh, I mean I'm gonna say the same stuff about world spine worm that I did about Galta this is a big scary trampler once again no way to reduce the cost built into the worm here uh, but it does have the advantage of pseudo replacing itself when it dies with three five five green worms with trample uh, so even though green doesn't have, I mean, well, green does have some graveyard recursion, but not like reanimation, you know. And, and I guess World Spine Worm can't really be in the graveyard anyway. So in, in, in lieu of that, it gets shuffled back in. I don't know, we have some good card draw, might get it back. Uh, it's a fine include. Like, as always, hold on, let, let's go back for a second. You don't want to overcommit to, like, jamming your deck with win conditions. Although I feel like that's a little less of an issue in Vorinclex here. Um... He just makes lots of mana, <laughs> which enables you to play lots of magic. Primordial Hydra, again, yeah, pretty good. Uh, you're looking for tramplers. You're looking for efficient tramplers, and this is one of them. Another way to get there, as it were, win the game. No complaints about Primordial, Primordial Hydra. Probably want somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 big, scary tramplers to try to close out games with. Um, next up, we have Asceticism. It's an expensive card. It's outside of the price range that I've set for cards for EDH Rec Tech. I don't want to put cards in that cost more than $15. And this one, at, at the current moment, does. Um, if it didn't, though, let's see. Would we want this? I, hmm, I don't I don't know necessarily. It does do a good job of protecting Vorinclex. It's an extra layer of protection for a commander that would be a very big target. So for that reason, yeah, you know what? I think that that would be pretty important. Um, that said, you can maybe get around the need for that by just casting Vorinclex strategically, sitting back, waiting until opponents have expended some resources so that Vorinclex will be a little bit safer. Um, and, and even if... 
Vorinclex doesn't have protection and does get dealt with. Uh, we're running so many ramp effects in a mono green deck that you might be able to cast him without much problem even if one is, when he's been killed like two or three times. And eventually, hopefully, your opponents will run out of ways to deal with him and let you get that massive tempo swing. Champion of Ronus may be exerted when you attack to put a creature from your hand onto the battlefield. I, uh, I don't necessarily love this. Like, yes, we do run a, a decent handful of big scary tramplers that, you know, maybe we'd rather exert a four drop to get onto the battlefield, but we run so many ramp effects in Vorinclex, like I was just saying, that, like, we can probably just hard cast them. We probably don't really need this. Not to mention that Vorinclex, well, one, can't be put into play with the exert ability unless he somehow got bounced to our hand, but not from the command zone. And, uh, you know, once he does get into play, he, he helps us cast them by doubling our mana. I mean, you know, at that point we already have, you know, maybe arbitrarily large amounts of mana in the first place, but just, I don't know, I, I don't love it. I, I feel like if it's worth running this in your deck, you're probably running too many big scary tramplers anyway. Primal Crux, uh, you know, another big scary trampler. Not too much to say, really. It starts as a 6-6 six, because six, he's got six green mana symbols already, and you know, you're gonna have other permanents out there with green mana symbols. Big scary tramplers, you need a way to win. You know, probably want about 10 to 15 of these in only one color. You don't have that many options, so this one I, I, I would recommend. It's a pretty good one if that's how you're trying to win. Nylea, God of the Hunt. Uh, don't love it because your creatures already have trample. If, like the, in the deck that I'm building anyway, one of the main qualifications for a creature to, you know, go in there, if it's not just like a mana dork, is it has to have evasion of some sort which in green normally means trample uh, so i don't need to spend some amount of the four mana of nilea to grant double trample that doesn't do anything and beyond that uh well she doesn't have trample uh and, and granting plus two plus two to creatures that are already big and scary just doesn't seem all that good i can't recommend nilea at least not in the sort of vorinclex deck that i am running Ulamog the Infinite Money. Excuse me. Ulamog the Infinite Gyre. It's actually not... I mean, it's kind of expensive. It's, what, like 30, 40, somewhere in there. Right now. It could go up. <laughs> it will go up, probably. Unless they reprint it. Even then. Who knows? Weird things happen with card markets. I don't know how I got on this tangent. Oh, right. Ulamog. Uh, yeah, right. Too much money to put in our decks, but is good. If you have if you have one, yeah, this would be a good shell for it. <laughs> Not, not really that much to say about a lot of these signature cards because they are just like big scary tramplers that you want 10 to 15 of and these are the good options. Omnath, although <laughs> I guess I guess Ulamog does not trample. He annihilates. Seems good enough. Omnath, Locus of Mana. Again, expensive card. Maybe do for a reprint. That'd be cool if they reprinted this card. Even if they don't though, no, sorry, even if they do and the price drops and it becomes viable to put in a deck where no cards cost more than $15, would it be worth it? I mean, the ability is very strong, and Omnath can become very, very big, uh, but there's no built-in evasion, and I don't know if it's worth the deck slots to try to give evasion to it, because, like, our commander already has trample evasion, and, you know, anything, any ability that's stapled to some legs, you know, any ability that's on a creature... Any ability with legs, you know, it, this thing has legs, which means that they can be knocked out from under him, as in destroyed. Uh, so, you know, potential uh, card disadvantage here if someone deals with your Omnath, and it is a very potent threat, so people very well might deal with it. I don't know, I'm on the fence about it, could go either way. And Planar Bridge... <laughs> I, I am not running this in my Vorn Klex deck, because in order to get value out of it immediately, that's 14 mana, six to cast, eight to use it. And I I just want to spread my threats out evenly enough. Like there's no one big scary trampler that I need. I just need a few of them. Doesn't matter which few of them. So to dedicate deck slots and tempo to like fetching up a specific one, I don't think it's really necessary. I think you'd be better served running card draw and then drawing into one of your threats with no real regard for which particular one it is. Doesn't really matter in this build. So there you have it. Those are the signature cards in Vorinclex and my opinions about them. Uh, let's get to this deck tech, all right? We're calling this deck Hangry Vorinclex. It's 
pretty good. It's a pretty good name. Mono Green Good Stuff is the name of the game that gets there fast. We're ramping and ramping and ramping. And not only are we ramping, but we're doing like fast ramp. As fast ramp as we can for under $15. Uh, it does all the things that Green loves to do. That is ramping, creature-based card draw, and scary tramplers. Uh, Green probably loves to do some other things too, but those, those are three big ones. Uh, ahead of the curve, Vorinclex is a massive tempo swing. If you're ramping into Vorinclex real fast, locking down your opponent's mana, uh, it kind of goes against some advice I was given earlier about maybe casting Vorinclex strategically when you don't think that he'll be able to be dealt with right away. But uh, I don't know, whenever you wind up casting Vorinclex, it can be a big, big, big tempo swing. You will become a target, so make sure you're being careful about when exactly that is. Opponents will gang up on you. And remember <laughs> what it feels like to have a Vorinclex under an opponent's control. Ramp! We're looking at the fundamentals here. Uh, we have great ramp. That's why it's hot pink. We got 25 ramp effects. Super duper good. That's a lot. We're going to get there fast. Draw effects. We're in good shape. We have 13. It, it, that number alone might normally get us uh, a, a rating of average draw, average number of draw effects. But because the draw effects are so potent, they're normally creature based. So they are contingent on us having like a big scary creature in play. But often they're like. Draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control, which is like seven usually or more. Uh, and that, you know, that alone is sometimes enough to win a game. Uh, control wise, we're not in the greatest shape because Mono Green is hard pressed for great control options. So, in lieu of that, uh, put pressure on opponents, attack opponents, keep their life totals low so that they have to hold up blockers and not be attacking you instead. Uh, it's a race, right? You're racing them to zero. You're, you're trying to get them to zero anyway. Um, oh, wow, that, that's not on the screen entirely. Ramp into more ramp into a few tramplers. Begin attacking as soon as possible. Refill your hand, keep ramping, keep forcing opponents to interact. Drop Vorinclex once opponents seem out of most interaction op. Options, option. I think that says options, but it's cut off a little bit, so I don't know for certain. Hey, I have a question for you. Do you want? Do you like magic cards? Are you a person that likes magic cards? Because you can buy them on the internet uh, through Flipside Gaming if you want. There are lots of options, but all else being equal, why not do? Why not go with an option that supports uh, EDH Rec Tech, this show that you love so much? Uh, if you if you use a promo code POGO on a purchase through FlipSideGaming.com, I'll get a little bit of that. It would mean a lot to me. It would help me uh, continue making this sort of stuff, help, help me continue to find it worth my time. Uh, so think about that and actually do it. Don't even think about it. Just go go and buy a Black Lotus from them. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> also, send me bottom-up deck building ideas. What do I mean by that? EDH Rec Tech, just you know, building decks based on um, the signature cards of given commanders naturally lends itself to uh, what, what I would call top-down design. We're starting with the commander and then going from there. Uh, it lends itself to maybe more good stuff as it were decks where some of you might be more like you know, Wombo, Johnny combo magic type players uh what does that even mean let's not get into that just send send me an email with your favorite card synergies that you'd like to see me build decks around and for the next batch of content i'm doing after edh rec tech uh, we'll do more bottom up deck design okay cool card C cool cards that interact with each other in cool ways let me know about them dan brown universe at gmail.com First up, we're going to look at the mana base. Uh, this one is very complicated, so I need everyone to uh, really really get settled in, get focused. Maybe pause this and eat a meal so that uh, I have your full attention. First up, Blighted Woodland. We like a ramp effect stapled to our lands. We will take that. That is great. We are not hurting for color fixing in a mono green deck so we can afford a deck slot, especially when it enters untapped. Uh, and then we have a forest. Uh, and then we have a forest, and then a forest, and then a forest, and then a forest. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Myriad landscape enters tapped, which is a downside, but uh, other than that, enters or it is another ramp effect staple to a land. We will take it, uh, and it's more efficiently costed than Blighted Woodland, except for the fact that, en that it enters tapped, which is kind of a cost. But it's our only land that enters tapped, so we can get away with that in a battle cruiser meta. And then three snow-covered forests to top it off. Any guesses as to why? Leave a comment below. And then if you're right, 
Uh, great, and if you're wrong, you can always delete that comment. Okay, cool. Next up, taking a look at our ramp suite. Uh, often in green decks, I don't run any artifact ramp, but in Vorinclex, I am running some, uh, just because I, I think that there is a premium here on uh, effects that ramp us multiple turns on the curve at once, right? Like Basalt Monolith, for example. Yes, we do have to, you know, sacrifice some tempo to untap it like every other turn, but when it is played initially, it shoots you forward three turns on the curve, right? Because we're ultimately trying to get to a Vorinclex earlier than opponents can deal with it, or just, I mean, any time. But, like, getting up to a commander that costs that much, I just think there's a slight premium premium on these effects. Um, Hedron Archive, another example. It's a slow ring. Uh, soul ring, so good. This card... Soul ring's really good, guys. It's really good. Just had to yell to my neighbors. Uh, Thran, yeah, Thran Dynamo, same thing. Uh, Wayfarer's Bobble, not exactly the same thing, but it is uh, one mana, I mean, three mana ultimately, but the ability to control when you pay the two. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like a three mana ramp effect, I guess, but being able to drop it on turn one feels good. And then Worn Power Stone, another slow ring. Um, if you're not ramping multiple turns at once, the next best thing is being really mana efficient. Uh, and Findhorned, El Findhorned Elves accomplishes that. Uh, Functional Reprint, Elvish Mystic, Boreal Druid. I mean, it creates a colorless, but in a monocolored deck, we don't really care that much. We'll still have plenty of green. Birds of Paradise, a little bop. Uh, Arbor Elf. Uh, and then, yeah, just another pseudo Lanoir Elves. Uh, Crows and Restorer. Now, Crows and Restorer can ramp us multiple turns on the curve if uh, we have threshold otherwise she just untaps a land which is fine but she's in there basically for her threshold ability uh lanoir elves i mean like she's good without it right but that's why she makes the cut for this deck lanoir elves the original sakura tribe a little steve action uh two mana for a ramp effect uh, not as mana efficient, but it's a land instead of a creature, so it's more resilient. It survives board wipes. Uh, Voyaging Seder, again, two mana for a ramp effect. Wood Elves, uh, yeah, three mana to grab us a forest, and it enters untapped. Same net loss of mana on the turn as, like, a Voyaging Seder or Sakura Tribe Elder as a two mana ramp effect because that forest enters untapped. Gaia's Touch, this, if you know, this is a... As you can tell from looking at it, probably, a, a, a weird, somewhat obscure card. Uh, many of you have seen it, I'm sure. But if you haven't, if you're playing a mono green deck, I think it's pretty good. It uh, allows you to play an extra basic forest per turn. But of note here, if you have a basic forest and just a, some other land in your hand, play the other land first, and then the forest, like, you can get, you know, it's... It, the, it's good. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, yeah, it's good. And the fact that you can sacrifice it to add green green to your mana pool um, on some critical turn if you're trying to, I don't know, cast a Vorinclux. Uh, not bad. Then sorcery speed stuff, cultivate, you know, gold standard, explosive vegetation, or as I like to call it, boom boom broccoli. Not the best ramp spell in the game of Magic the Gathering, but because it puts us ahead two turns, there is a, a, a premium on that. Uh, into the North, if this is uh, the card you guessed when I was pointing out my snow-covered basics, then congratulations, you can leave your comment. Otherwise, now's your time to pause this and delete your comment if you're embarrassed about being wrong. But don't, no, don't delete. You, should, you shouldn't be. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You're engaging with quality content on YouTube, and that should be a reward in and of itself. Leave your comment guessing incorrectly in the comments. <laughs> don't, don't delete your comments. Kadama's Reach, same thing as Cultivate, Gold Standard, Nature's Lore. Yeah, very good. Uh... Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's really good. Search your library for a forest card and put it onto the battlefield untapped. That's very good. That's kind of like a one-mana ramp spell. Rampant Growth. Ranger's Path. See, this is probably strictly better than Explosive Vegetation in this deck, and maybe in most decks. Um, but, uh, yeah, Sky Shroud Claim then is, I think, I mean, strictly better isn't quite right because there are cases, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, Sky Shroud Claim. It's very good. Very, very good. Next up, we have some draw effects. I'd say an average amount at 13. Um, we do lean into artifacts a little bit. Green draws pretty well, but it's never like pure draw. It's always based on like 
creatures, not always, but often, usually, disproportionately, based on like how many creatures you have or the greatest power among creatures. So we lean into artifacts a little bit just because um, not as good as blue and black, I guess. But Lifecrafters Bestiary, uh, like this, it's a cheap card in standard right now. Uh, so a lot of you probably have one, and we have, I think, like 25 creatures, so more more likely than not. I mean, even just scrying after, you know, maybe five or six turns, you've gotten the three mana's worth you put into it. But if you can draw a card, like, pretty much immediate value. Uh, Mind's Eye, a little more artifact uh, card draw that we're tapping into. Just a very good effect in Commander, been printed many times, so uh, not too expensive of a card. Staff of Nin, six mana, maybe a little bit spendy, but to uh, draw a card every turn uh, on something that it's not enough of a threat to usually be dealt with, um, and drawing one extra card really can get you there, uh, especially in like a battle cruiser game of Magic. You're, you're likely to have many turns after your sixth, and in a deck that ramps as much as this one does. You know, you can get this in play uh, sooner than uh, your opponents might be able to play a six mana spell. Um, also, dealing one damage to a creature or player, often relevant. Uh, if nothing else, it's a way to nickel and dime opponents at the end step of the opponent's uh, turn who's before yours. Um, Soul of the Harvest. Yeah, we yeah we, again, we run like I think 25 or so creatures, so we will get value off of creatures coming into play. Regal Force. I, I like this one maybe a little bit better because its value is immediate, although I guess situational. Um, sometimes the ones that draw when creatures come into play or are cast, as is the case for Primordial Sage, uh, they can be better, but um, yeah, both good in decks with lots of creatures. Go figure. Hunter's Insight. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to a player, uh, you may draw that many cards. You target the creature. I mean, you can flash this in. You can cast this uh, after blockers have been declared. Uh, it's just very strong. You will often draw eight cards for three mana. Not a bad ratio. Garrick Primal Hunter. Um, yeah, often you're just using him as a sorcery to draw cards. Pay five mana, uses minus three, he immediately goes away. But uh, if Vorinclex is in play, that's like seven cards. So Harmonize should be in almost every like battle cruiser green deck. If you're playing a, like a, in a competitive combo meta, then maybe this isn't uh, mana efficient enough. But in, in a battle cruiser, I mean, ah, drawing three cards in exchange for one card, not bad. Hunter's Prowess, uh, similar thing to Hunter's Insight, it just gives a little boost to it, but isn't instant speed, right? So the opponent will know before they declare blockers, but if they don't have any blockers, which is often the case for at least one opponent in a multiplayer game, especially if you can ramp into this early, like you could do this to a Llanowar Elves, still worth it. Rishkar's Expertise, yeah, quintessential green uh, card draw effect equal to the greatest power of a creature you control. But this one, I mean, this is not, It's. I don't think this is the first time this has been featured in EDH Rec Tech, uh, and it certainly will not be the last time. Very good card. New as of Kaladesh, but EDH staple, I would go so far as to say. Shamanic Revelation, um, yeah, draw for each creature. Soul's Majesty, draw cards equal to the greatest power. That's just how green draws cards. That's how this deck draws cards. Pretty good draw engine, like not a huge number of draw effects, but many of these are drawing like I don't know, five or six cards. It definitely gets there. So mono green does not have a ton of great control options. I'm only running six in Vorinclex, which puts it in the poor territory. But what we are running is like quality, right? It, it is either very versatile or very explosive. But uh, you know, being in mono green, um, in lieu of control. Uh, often we just have to apply constant pressure to our opponents, force them to uh, play very conservatively because their life total has already taken a few big blows. So instead of attacking, they're holding up blockers. Instead of actively building a board, they're like holding up responses. Put them on the defensive. That's <laughs> the, the, the best plan in lieu of great control. But uh, the control we do have, uh, nev nev Nevenerals. Don't know how to say that. Never have known how to say it. I don't think anyone does. Everyone just says it really fast. New General's Disc. You know? New General's Disc. People just call it Disc. New General's Disc. It destroys everything. Destroyal artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. This deck does not... I mean, it just this deck runs a lot of creatures. Okay. Um, so you're not going to want to pop this off until your opponent's creatures are very threatening, obviously. Uh, well, I, I take that back. Like, where we can get an advantage through this is... Uh, we don't run very many artifacts or enchantments. Green 
loves the natural world. I mean, you know, you know how magic works. Bane of progress again. We don't run very many artifacts or enchantments, so this is pretty big uh, blowout. Uh, I mean, and it can turn into a very big creature, obviously. Uh, I don't consider it one of my win cons because it doesn't have any form of evasion, so it will usually just be blocked, but uh, still, you know, very good in mono green. Beast Within, this is the uh, versatility I was talking about. Hits any permanent, debatably the best removal spell or the single target removal spell in Commander. It's between this and Chaos Warp. Uh, scour from Existence, again, because we're so hard-pressed for removal, um, running some colorless here, seven mana, obviously very steep, but in a deck that is ramping as much as this one, um, not as steep as it might seem, and the ability to exile any permanent is, uh, yeah, that's, that's the level of versatility that we're looking for. Um, the Great Aurora. Huge effect, costs 9 mana, but we can get there pretty fast. We're ramping a lot. We all shuffle everything, our hand, our permanence, uh, into our libraries, and we draw that many cards. And we can put land cards from our hand onto the battlefield equal to that number. I don't know. It's, it's just a huge reset effect. And the person with their finger on the button when it comes to nuclear warfare, has an advantage. It's, it's, it's best to control when the nuke goes off. I'm not saying that if you picked a random board state that we'd always come out ahead with this, but it's just like one of the biggest nukes that green has. Um, and then finally, Desert Twister. Nothing too complicated here. Destroys any permanent. Sorcery speed. Doesn't exile. Not quite as good as Scour from Existence, but uh, it's one fewer mana. So there, there's that. Very versatile. And here we have the way that Vorinclex is trying to win. Again, these are battle cruiser decks. So, uh, tramplers. I did an advanced magic search for creatures with trample in the color identity green. I sorted by converted mana cost and worked my way backwards and included 11. I'm going to say this like a thousand times in EDH Rec Tech. Once you've decided how you want to win, you don't need to dedicate 30 deck slots to it. Dedicate 10 to 15 and then support that win condition really well with ramp, card draw, and control, especially card draw. If you have lots of card draw, you don't need that many win conditions, okay? Even even fewer deck slots if you're in more of a combo meta, but that's kind of a different series. Anyway, uh, first up in alphabetical order, the big bad, Emrakul, the promised end. Like, yeah, th th taking control of an opponent's turn in a, a format where the power level is as high as vintage and games go to turn 15 is very good. <laughs> you can probably knock out a problem opponent with a different problem opponent's turn and then have that original problem opponent come close to suiciding themselves. Uh, yeah, very, yeah, re really good. Um, and then for, for the rest of these, um, they're often just big tramplers, right? That I, I'm, I'm very excited about this deck because usually I don't have an excuse to run big tramplers because if you have, I don't know, flying, usually I think flying is better in Commander, uh, and so if I'm in <laughs> any color other than green, we have access to big flyers, but uh, it's not, nice to have an excuse to build a deck with some other form of evasion, and Galta has it in spades. Definitely has Trample. Uh, Giant Ataphage, love this card. Uh, if you haven't heard of it and you're trying to win in kind of a battle cruisery type meta, uh, yeah, it clones itself, and it's worth pointing out that the clones also clone themselves. Okay, right? It doesn't say just the non-token copies do. The tokens also get that text. It is an exponentially growing threat, as is Colonian Hydra. Another exponentially growing threat in a different way. It is one creature. It can be felled by one removal spell, but uh, still pretty good for five mana. Primordial Hydra, you know, we have lots of mana to get this up to a trample status. Uh, mana Gorger Hydra gets real big real fast. Lifeblood Hydra can be real big when we have all the mana in the world, and it draws us cards when it dies. I could have included this in the card draw section. Uh, Cal Calni Hydra. Just an 8-8 trampler that can cost real cheap. Soul of New Phyrexia. 6-6 six, six trampler that can grant indestructible, which is particularly good if you also have a Nivernal's Disc in play. Uh, Verderous Gearhulk, yeah, just an 8-8 for 5 with Trample, or you can put this counter somewhere even more useful, like, say, on a Lifeblood Hydra. Uh, Woodfall Primus, uh, yeah, a little bit of control stapled to a pretty big Trampler that's resilient. It comes back into play. So, yeah, there you have it. That's uh, our, our, our Tramplers. Just all right, well, a few more cards. 
Finally, we have Vorenklex's miscellaneous value slash clothes. We'll start with the clothes slash accessories as Hammer. Hammer of Nazan, uh, making Vorenklex indestructible just seems pretty decent, especially if Vorenklex also has haste and shroud and or hexproof and haste. You know, a hexproofy, indestructible Vorenklex seems like a good way to... Uh, Gain an advantage over your opponents. Uh, next up in value, Worldly Tutor. Searching, searching for a creature card, putting it on top. Um, yeah, I believe this card is under $15. Might be kind of on the bubble there, but uh, very, very powerful effect, especially in a deck with 26 creatures. Court of Calling um, searches up a creature and puts it in onto the battlefield. Mana is usually not an issue in Vorn Clex, so we can tutor up, I don't know, uh, Bane of Progress for a little bit of control. Maybe the uh, Persisty Doodle that uh, destroys a non-creature permanent if we want a control effect, or there are draw effects we can search up with this, things that draw this cards equal to the uh, number of creatures that we have on the battlefield, um, or just a big scary Trampler. You know, why not? Court of Calling, very good miscellaneous value and then Praetor's Council sort of like a card draw effect except you have to wait until the end game so that you have a really beefy graveyard but then it can be you know uh, a kind of hybrid between a draw effect and just like a game winning effect Praetor's Council top notch especially when we have all of the mana in the world and our opponents are struggling to untap their lands because of our Vorinclex all right, let's see how Vorinclex plays in a little bit of one on zero, one on goldfish. Uh, draw our opening hand, there it is. Looks pretty good. We have two ramp effects, the bobble and the rampant growth. Uh, three lands, and then a boots to protect the Vorinclex, and then a Kalni Hydra to get there in the end. Uh, the one thing that we are missing is card draw, but hopefully we'll hit some. Uh, yeah, definitely keepable. Let's see what we draw into. Oh, look, there's our card draw. Uh, we'll play a forest, pay one, drop the bobble, of course. Go to turn two, untap, draw. It's a cultivate. We will play a forest, and then probably best to just go ahead and pop the bobble and turn hold up the two mana. Who knows? Uh, we'll go ahead and look. We'll snag another forest. It'll enter tapped. We'll move to turn three, untap, draw, another forest. We will play that forest. Uh, then we can... Uh, if we cultivate, we have one left. If we rampant growth, we have two left. Either way, well, yeah, so let's rampant growth and then swift foot boots. That seems like the best option here. Drop a forest into play, and then uh, for two more, get the boots out there. And get the ramp in our graveyard. Move to turn four. Rampity, rampity, rampity. Uh, look, even more rampity. Play a forest. So we have six mana available. We could cultivate, we could boom boom broccoli, we could mind's eye and start drawing. Uh, the Calni Hydra it costs eight. You have to count all the mana symbols to remember how much it costs each time. No, it costs eight. I, I think in this situation, um, I would probably drop the mind's eye. Just begin drawing cards. Pay one, draw during our opponent's turn cycle. Uh, and get some of those land drops next to ramp things out of the way. Um, drawing a pain of progress, kind of awkward right now, after playing the Mind's Eye and the Swift Foot Boots. Uh, you're probably going to sit back on that bane of progress and try to have a late game major tempo swing. Uh, meanwhile, we have seven mana, one short of a Vorinclex. Uh, we could boom boom and cultivate. <laughs> we can boom boom. <laughs> that means poop. For three. All right. For three mana here, what we're going to do is we're going to cultivate. Uh, we're going to search our library. Rampity, rampity, rampity. Get a forest into play. Reveal a forest and put it into our hand. Um, and then, yeah, boom boom broccoli puts them into play tapped. So I, I, I probably wouldn't play that just because we're already going to have the eight mana we'd need for a, uh, a Colony Hydra or a Vorinclex plus the one to equip it with the boots next turn. So I'd rather be drawing cards with Mind's Eye. Let's say we have three opponents and they each draw during their draw step. So we'll draw, 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 and then we'll move to turn six. Untap, draw again, main phase, play a forest. We have a full grip and kind of a judgment call here. Soul of the Harvest doesn't seem terrible. 6-6 six, six Trampler can immediately start swinging. Uh, the Colony Hydra uh, can cost less over time if we play the Soul first. Or we could just go in immediately 
for a Vorinclex um, and hope that no one has counters. We'd be, you know, looking around to see what sort of mana is up, who might be able to respond to an equip uh, trigger on the Swiftfoot Boots. So, yeah, you know what? I think the most conservative line of play is probably 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Drop a Soul of the Harvest, uh, then equip the Boots to it. Uh, probably move to combat and attack with a 6-6 Trampler, and then um, probably end our turn and draw one card, and then draw two cards during our opponent's turns. Very good, we will untap, draw, this is turn seven, main phase, uh, drop a forest. We have ten mana from our lands, and that's, that's all we have, we have ten mana available to us. The Colony Hydra now costs seven, we could grant it haste, we could sit back on a scour from existence, we could try to drop Vorinclex, um, Court of Calling, I don't have <laughs> the encyclopedic knowledge of this deck that I would otherwise need um, to figure out what might be the best thing to do with this. Um, but I don't know, let's let's figure it out. You know, for the, for the purposes of gold fishing, I, I'm, I'm just going to look at my library. I'm not even going to pay for the Court of Calling. I'm not going to try. Uh, it's okay to <laughs> uh, do things like that. Well, so is Court of Calling green only? No, it's any creature card. So, 3, 6, 9, we have 10 mana available. Um, that would be enough to get something that costs 7 or less. Galta is not a good option. Giant Adiphage would be a pretty good option. Um, the Colonian Hydra would be a pretty good option. Uh, just getting some threats immediately. Uh, Primordial Sage uh, wouldn't draw us this turn necessarily. Uh, Regal Force would immediately draw us two cards, although we're not really hurting for much of anything. It, it might even be more conservative to uh, lean back and just sit on the scour from existence. Of course, we do have Woodfall Primus. I don't think we have quite enough mana to get that into play with the Court of Calling. But I uh, yeah, just wanted to take a look one more time to see what might be there. So maybe the Court of Calling is not the best option right now. Maybe we just want to um, start applying some pressure with a Colony Hydra. Or hold up a scour from existence. Again, this depends on what the board looks like. Um, I am likely going to pump the brakes right there on gold fishing just because, you know, you, you get a sense for the advantageous board position we find ourselves in on turn seven, eight cards in hand, all the mana in the world. Um, just no way to really know what the best line of play is from here. There's not like one combo we're going for in this battle cruiser hypothetical metagame. So, anyway, that is. EDH Rec Tech. This is gold, been gold fishing with EDH Rec Tech. I'm, my name is Dan Brown, and uh, if you haven't called your mother in the last week, you might consider doing that. Uh, until next time, uh, this is Pogo Back Gaming. Subscribe, subscribe, click that button. Make sure that you get those notifications every time I come out with new content, and uh, check out all the links in the description. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good luck. Have fun. Remember, the real win condition is having the most fun, and and the real the real game is the metagame, right? And your place in it. Your place in the social situation of the metagame. Just be be kind to one another, okay? That's, that's really what I'm getting at. Be decent to each other. Okay, all right.